Welcome to the Working Class Bowhunter Podcast, episode 460. Oof. Is every 10 episodes a milestone at this point? Or yeah, we absolutely. Just, it is? Yeah, because yeah. then we forget like what episode we're on, so right. in between. It's a new era of sixes. That's right. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. We appreciate your support. Uh, this is the third. We're, we're going to keep counting down how many in-studio guests we have until it just gets old. Until um, <laughs> we get to 460. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We get to another four hundred and sixty, <laughs> right? And that's how it works. Uh, Kurt Geyer speaking. Doug Schmidt, Eric Common, Austin Chandler, and another special guest in studio, Mister Todd Anderson. Thank you so much for being here, man. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. It, by the way, before we get this off the rip here, congratulations on the studio. This place is amazing. Thank you. you guys did Thank a you. bang up job. Thank Super you. Cool. You got to kind of see it like in construction yeah, zone and all I that. I did. I stopped in once and uh, you guys were still kind of in the middle of it. And yeah, what it turned into is, uh, you know, Super awesome. Well, I will say for all our guests and uh, people who've been a guest or future guests or listeners, whatever, if you're going to make it here, you brought us a really cool gift that allows us to like basically print Polaroid photos from our phone. So yeah. when we take like studio pictures of like guests we've had in, we can now print them out. And they're like perfect sized where we can put them up and like make a board so people can see right. who've been in studio and stuff like that. So we appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome, man. No problem. And it's kind of crazy. So you did a podcast with us for the first time December, you said? Yeah, middle of December. If you guys didn't listen to that, go back. It's a another very, um, I, I would consider high level whitetail podcast. You're, uh, you're a local guy to us. You are a big buck killer. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we talked about two bucks you killed last season. If you want to recap like what those bucks were real quick so people kind of know that you truly are a big buck killer if they didn't hear that episode. It's definitely well worth the listen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was it was fun coming in and, and you know, first po- first time podcasting. So it was it was uh, definitely a really cool experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it just kind of capped off an amazing season that I had where in October, late October, I think it was October 30th, killed a uh, 179 and 7 eighths. Um, <laughs> basically mainframe typical with a fork G3. And then two weeks later, I ended up killing a 198 and 7 eighths inch seven by five mainframe with a forked G2 on his left. So 13 point typical, basically. Just an absolute slob. Yeah, yeah. big deer. And we got to hold both those bucks mm-hmm. in studio. You brought actually those two deer and a big muley you killed. Yeah, I killed a, a 185 muley out in Colorado the first week of October before those white tails. That, so. that might be the most perfect season of all time. I'd consider yeah. that a yeah, dream yeah. season. Yep. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was uh, pretty blessed last year. So it, I just wanted to cover that a little bit. If someone hadn't heard that previous episode, or if for some reason they were to doubt your um, ability to kill big animals, <laughs> uh, we had to just cover that because you are like, I consider, I don't know if this is like a term that everyone uses, but I use it, um, a local legend. Like you're a guy in our area that gets it done consistently on big deer. And, and you're pretty much, you're a professional hunter that just doesn't have a TV show or a, like a a major platform where people will know you all over. But you're, 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 do, you're killing the same caliber of deer as whatever guy that has that type of shit is, yeah. you know? Well, you know, it's, it's when you get to a certain point, it just becomes what you want to do and, and you pour yourself into it. It's, it's a passion of mine, no doubt about it. Yeah. I spend a lot of time. Uh, walking the timber, sitting on a tractor, doing food plots um, in the tree. I, you know, this time of year, I'll take my girls out and we'll just be glassing, looking for deer. And it's just part of the lifestyle. So, yeah. 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 It's just a party at this point. Like, you're Absolutely. Not, you're not consciously thinking about it because it's just kind of your lifestyle in general. No, I mean, you know, we're, we're while we're recording this, it's just after July 4th. And, and it was like, that's just kind of one of those days that in my life is like, okay, flip the switch and now it's deer time. Deer season, yeah. You know? yep. Your mindset so. changes. I've noticed that too, like just in like social media interaction from, I mean, the time of recording, you know, it's Thursday, 4th of July was last weekend. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, it's like, I can already feel it. I feel it in my mindset, you know, it's going forward. It's like, I'm already thinking like, all right, the, here comes training days for the mule deer hunt. Here comes yep. training days, getting prepared for whitetail. The spy points need to get out. We're going to start seeing who's who's still around, who's new to the block. Mm-hmm. You know, what what's going on. You're kind of going from there and assessing. So um, that being said, right now, I mean, is there deer that you're looking forward to seeing from previous seasons? Are you – because I, I know – I guess let me kind of – say this before you, you go into that. I, I don't always have deer that I'm looking forward 
to see coming in the next season. I don't always have like ground that I can pattern or whatever, but I know if I hold out and play my cards right, one's going to pop up and I got to find them and get in on it. Um, so where are you at right now? Are you are you looking forward, dear, that you knew from last season? Or are you hoping for somebody new to pop up? Or uh, yeah, probably both. I would say. Yeah. Um, you know, so last year <laughs> there was there were there were two pull, or three. Pull your mic up just a little bit. You're yeah, good. you got it. Um, so last year there were two Beautiful. or three good ones that you know. One of them was a four year old. We found his sheds in January, and they taped at about 160. So I'm really excited to see what he turns into. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then another one was a deer that I, I'm guessing him to be five and a half last year, so he'll be six this year. And real wide deer, short G2s, long G3s, but we found his sheds as well. Very massive deer, and he was in the 170s. So mm-hmm. those two deer are kind of who I'm, I've really got my eyes on. But um, beyond those two there's always a few deer that move in, you know, we're on a big long Creek and and just the way that it goes, you know, I killed two overly mature deer last year. So that makes room for a couple more to come in. Right. right. And And probably would have, yeah, uh, you're good there. You're kind of, you cleared over the cap. Right. I guess is probably the way to put that. Right. Yeah. And especially with the long Creek line like that, you never know what's going to be coming through there. Exactly. So, um, it, it seems like on our place, we have deer that show up in the summer. We may get, three or four trail cam pictures of them. And it's kind of hard to inventory in Illinois just because we can't put out feed for them. Right. Um, right. So you kind of have to hit pinch points and mm-hmm. fence crossings and, and that, that being said, gates. Do you get stressed about like what you do or don't have in velvet for pictures because of that reason? Or do you, do you, are you kind of the guy that's, Oh, you know, I don't have a ton of velvet pitchers, but I'm not stressing because once the velvet's off, a ton changes with like smaller proper private property areas and stuff like that. Like, you know, are you like, oh, when the velvet comes off, I'll get what I want type of thing, or I'll see maybe see a deer that piques my interest. Well, it's always nice to know that there's some good ones on the farm, you know, getting them in velvet. And and typically there's two or three that we'll get. Um, but almost every year there's one or two that show up that you're just like, well, where'd he come from? Right. Yeah. You know, so kind of one of those randoms that just show up. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. and it's, it's kind of, I don't know if you'd say cyclical, but it's just like one of those things where the way that our land sits, if there's nothing there during the, during the summer, something's going to show up in the fall. And yeah. usually once one comes in, we have enough does on the place that they're going to stick around. Right. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Which is good. And, yeah, and you're putting in the work to kind of hopefully keep them around because you're not just. So I, I just think I don't want people to think they see your big deer and that you just got it made, but like you're actually putting in work. Like there's food plot work and and land management work that goes in to keep deer like that around. That's why you're able to kill two caliber like world class type bucks in a season for that reason. You know, like it's not it's not by luck by any means. Well, yeah, part of it is you know. Of course, we're putting in the work in the summer, and all year long, really. And then um, we we just have a lot of deer in the area, thankfully. And we are very cognizant of the fact that we don't want to put pressure on these deer. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of the farm that we just kind of give to the deer. And so they be, they get very comfortable in there. The last, I would say, five or six years, I can't think of a year where we didn't have three or four shooters that we identified going into the season just because, yeah. you know, it's it's been managed to the point that we give those deer the area. And and if you don't push deer around too much, they're going to stick around. Yeah. 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 Est- establishing a sanctuary on your farm, no matter how big of a farm you have, if you can dedicate a certain portion of your farm towards a sanctuary, a place that you don't go in, um, it seemed to have really elevated a lot of the trail camera pictures that I got on several of my farms. Yeah. So yeah. that's, yeah. See, we that's something that gets brought up a lot, of course, you know, in 460 episodes. Like, pressure mm-hmm. is a thing. You know, when we have Mark Durian, he talks about pressure. And I found in the last, like, sep- like, three, four years of me hunting, the less time, it feels good to spend time out there because you feel like, I'm doing this, this, and this, and this. It feels like you're accomplishing something when you could actually be doing harm. Yeah, I almost feel like it's better if you kind of, like, do your major scouting while you're actively hunting and then be conscious as your entry and exit and then spend the least amount of time as possible in the summer coming into the fall. And I feel like that pays off bigger. Do you feel the same way, like, when it comes to just pressure in general? Absolutely. I mean, 
the good thing about my place is that there's a lot of timber there. So when I'm out there during the summer, specifically, I, um, I'll, I want, I'm not going to be running through there with four wheelers. I'm not going to be doing a lot of movement where I'm sneaking up on deer. If I'm going through the mow the trails, I'm going slow. And there's enough topography that deer will hear me coming and they may be two ridges away from me. Right. And then by the time I get to where they are now, they've already circled back around. And it's just, I'm not sneaking up on anything. I'm not pushing them around. You're not surprising no, them. No, exactly. Crazy. Exactly. And, you know, I think like a lot of animals, deer kind of get used to their environment. So once they kind of associate that, oh, that's a tractor coming through mowing. Yeah. He's done that 30 times over my life. Right. It's, it's not, almost like it's a diesel engine. I'm cool. Yeah. It's not a threat, right? They, you yeah. know, con- like, they get kind of comfortable with it. For the most part, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so if you're kind of consistent in what you're doing and you don't surprise them, you don't push them, um, they get comfortable in there and you give them enough area that they can get away from you pretty easily, Yeah, I think that they'll get comfortable and, and they'll just hang around. Well, and I think that's like a big mistake that a lot of people do is I get a lot of people ask me when they first get their first trail camera, they go set it up, they get a big buck on camera, then they're in there like every week checking it. I tell them. Social media guys. Yep. I'm like, hey. Just stay the hell out of there. He'll be on that camera, trust me. Yeah. Just you don't have to look at it. Yeah. But if you got him on there once, stay out of there for two months. He'll be good. Just don't fuck with him. Right. That, you know, I think that is, and I don't consider myself near on the level as like, you know, a Todd or an Austin, Austin or right. a Ross. Like you, I look up to you guys um, as being like up in the top tier of like big buck killers in there, but you guys are just like our buddies, which is even cooler, right? Like we get to talk to you guys like this, but you know, I'm getting to the point more and more, like I get a buck in velvet. I don't really get over excited. I'm not rushing in to try and set more trail cams. It's like, you know, but I've also have, I have more hunting experience to know, okay, he's, I know he's in there. He's in there right. in velvet. He's in there in velvet for a reason. He's not moving as far because he's still in velvet. So his home area in velvet is in there. If I stay the fuck out of there, I got good lithium batteries and I did everything I need to do from whatever cell camera I'm running. We run spy point. Then I'm good. You know, hopefully that camera, the batteries are going to last. I'll get pictures of them. Go in, you know, go in only when needed and I'll adjust my cameras, make sure everything's good. And then I'm out of there until I got to make moves and can learn more. Of course, you know, when you're going in and out, like if you're going to hunt, you know, you make your adjustments on the fly. So you're not fucking around for no reason. But I've just kind of learned like that pressure or lack of pressure or lack mm-hmm. of involvement is better. But we talk about this a lot, especially the more and more we get into it. Social media makes you want to fuck around in your woods more. <laughs> it does. Because you see like the guy who might not have as much experience, but is playing it like he has a ton of experience is in there taking selfies of him sweating in the middle of the timber, setting his trail camera on. He's like, cams are out. The fleet's out. You know what I mean? Doing that when real, and then that guy has nothing to show for it. Come October, November. Right. Do you, do you feel like that's pretty accurate or I mean, what's, yeah, I mean, I think you nailed it for sure. There's a lot of guys that are just kind of like chasing that, that notoriety online Yeah, and there, there's an, ex, there's a cost to doing that. Right. Yeah. Especially if you're not hunting 2000 acres or whatever. I mean, yeah. you can't burn your deer up. That, that's just period. That's it. You can't do it. Um, so you know, I've, I don't get super into social media. Um, yeah. I don't worry about posting velvet deer. First of all, I don't want everybody knowing what I got going on. We don't right. post trail in my cam place pictures. Either. You know what I mean? Yeah. We just, so, we post just them after the deer's dead. That's my yeah, philosophy. That's it. Yeah. 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 I'd much rather put hero shots out there than, hey, there's there's three really great bucks on my farm. and Trail cam picks are for after death. Yep. I think so, too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that sucks because we have a trail cam sponsor, yeah. but they just kind of have to deal with that. Well, yeah. that's just how it is. But, yeah, I mean, we share them between ourselves, but as far as social media goes... They're memorial pics at yeah, this point. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. I mean, no question about yeah. it. Trail cam pictures, trail cameras are a huge tool to identifying what's out there. And, you know, once you know what's on your place or it's in the neighborhood, it makes it a lot easier to pass deer that maybe you'd be tempted by if you didn't know there was two or three really good ones around. Right. Um, yeah. That I've had numerous bucks over the years that you may get one or two pictures of them and you know they're in the woods. It, it, I almost think that some of them are a little bit camera shy. Like mm-hmm. I've had pictures where I've seen bucks coming through an area and then next thing you know, they're like staring at the camera and you don't get another picture of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then you go in there and that camera's pointed in, I don't know, what would you say, 20-degree angle 
you know, yeah. it's capturing or 40 to five degrees, whatever it is. Those deer are smart enough that they can get, they can stay away from that, that area that's going to capture them. Oh yeah. Yeah. And definitely. So you just have to be really patient on the big ones. I, I, I agree with that. And I think I talked about, was it last season a lot, how like the, the camera doesn't tell the whole story. Yeah. It helps and it can give you confidence going into an area. But I feel that a lot of people, if they have like, they don't have the experience of like what a trail camera actually captures or you sat over a trail cam cause you weren't getting pictures of it and you went in there to see, and then you realize all the deer are 20 yards behind the tree behind exactly. it. You're yeah, like, right. Oh shit. They're cutting around. But, but then it made me wonder is like, is my, the way I had my trail camera set up, is that diverting how the deer were moving? Because one buck solid or at one doe in a group of five got spooky and did the whole bob and weave at it. And then all the other deer got weird about it, so now they're moving thirty yards behind it or whatever it is. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's the thing probably you never the ca- you never know. It probably right. is. It's you never painting, know. It's painting a general picture of the farm, mm-hmm. right? So you set out three or four cameras on a farm. Even if you just get one or two pictures of that big one, at least you know he's in there. Like it's, it's just you're taking a general inventory. Doesn't mean really anything other than that deer is you have the potential to see that deer on that farm. Yeah, that's the way I look at it in the early season, anyways. For sure. I think that's a good way to look I, at it. I don't get excited about velvet pictures. Like, it's awesome to get to take some general inventory. If you have a good one, fine. If not, it might be November before I see a big deer show up on my There's farm. a lot of season left. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, yeah. I used to stress about it, like, oh, shit, I got nothing. But I don't anymore because I'm kind of, like, used to how it goes. Like, the reality of, like, how deer move or how just how trail cameras work. Like Yeah, it's it, tough in Illinois to take inventory in the early season. It is tough. We don't get the big time feed picks like these spoiled Iowa boys yeah. goes to suck. <laughs> <laughs> Dick bags. Well, and, and in a lot of areas too, I mean, a big deer in the summer, he may be three miles away right. out in some ditch in the middle of a cornfield where there's yep. plenty of cover. And as soon as those crops come out. And there's going to be a lot of cover in the early yeah, season. Absolutely. Yeah. And as soon as those crops come out, they just completely relocate. Yeah. I mean, we, we had a, yeah. We had a deer. He would show up every year, like three years in a row, he showed up the weekend between first and second shotgun season. Like, so he, my guess is he was just hanging out somewhere in some little patch of timber, never got any pressure. And then a couple of shotgun guys would go in, bump him, and he'd come right to our place. Mm, he's just hiding out. That's it. Yeah. I mean, why not? I mean, that's the smartest thing to do. If you were a whitetail buck in Illinois, that say you're a 180 inch whitetail buck. I'd be doing the same shit. Right. Hey, if someone's trying to murder you, you know, at your own house, you're going to go to the neighbor's house, right? And hang out for a while. That might be the best way to put it. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Because, you know what I'm saying? You know, me thinking about it, I'm like, yeah, dude, if someone's trying to kill me, it's like, oh yeah, someone's trying to murder me in my house. I'm going to my parents' house, you know, next door. I'm going to go lay on top of a subway somewhere. Like people aren't going to find me. They just think of the weirdest places to hide. Yeah. Right. That's right. Well, that's why like, I think some guys turn their noses up to like the one acre, two acre, three acre, four acre patches. that's what the megalodons. Mm -hmm. 80% Mm -hmm. of the time, that's where those big boys are hanging up. There's a big high 40s eight out here that my dad killed literally on two acres of timber, like a patch. It was was just basically a creek run through a cornfield and a bean field, and it's one circle patch of timber, and that's where my dad shot that buck. Well, you've guys seen some of my pictures on that one farm, and it's less than an acre of timber. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the spot they... That's where they go. They see it's the only spot for cover and no one else is going to go there. But the guy that might hang one stand on the right wind and get lucky. Um, Moving into that with kind of the, the, the pattern of, of possible inconsistencies or consistencies. At what point do you feel when you see a buck, say you get a trail cam photo of a big buck, what point are you like, all right, I think I can get on this deer. I'm going to pattern this specific deer. So are you, when, when would, let's just say, when was that picture gotten? Say late July. Late July. Okay. So if I get a picture of a really good deer in late July, um, he's probably very comfortable on my farm Mm -hmm. just because if he's in there at that point, he's, that's his, that's where he's living. Okay. Um, there's a lot of deer that may not be on my farm in July that'll show up a little bit later, Mm -hmm. but if he's there in July, he's there. You know? He's there. Yeah. Even so, in full velvet, he you think he's going to stick around. Yeah, he may shift a little bit one way or another, but he's going to be somewhere. That like can, when the velvet comes off. Yeah. You know? um, so I don't get too excited about hunting them, the, the mature deer, the bucks at least, until 
I would say that last week of October. Um, oh, really? Yeah. I mean, now if we're in, what, what, say, what do you mean though? I like, kind of break that down. Like what, what's you, if you get a, a picture of a buck in late July, you don't get excited about hunting them until late October. Correct. Yeah. Really? No, I mean, I'm not going to go in there and try to kill them on opening day or, you know, if it's 85 degrees in the afternoon, I'm not going to be like, you know, he's coming to this food plot. I'm going to go hope that he comes out with right. enough time. Okay. You know, there's a lot of stuff happens, I think, where a guy will go into a spot and the damage they do, you don't even realize. Like, you leave so much scent when it's warm out. Mm -hmm. Entry exits, obviously huge. We know mm -hmm. that. Um, but those deer, when they come out, if say you're say you're on the edge of timber, you're out in a food plot that's on an edge, you come into a ground blind or you get in a tree stand right on the edge and you hunt, you don't see anything. He doesn't come out. Maybe you see some does, whatever. You get down, you leave. You think, okay, I didn't booger him up. He didn't, he didn't come out. He doesn't know I was there. There's a real good chance he's going to come out an hour or two hours after dark and say, wait a minute, something's not right. Right. You know, there was a person in here and now you just maybe pushed him to the neighbor's farm or you made him completely nocturnal. Mm -hmm. So the risk reward at that point to me just isn't there. Um, I've killed, you know, quite a few pretty good deer. And in the early years, I would say October 1st is here. It's hunting season. I'm hunting. I'm going to be in a tree. I'm going to be after him. And it just never came together. I've killed one good deer on October 1st, and it was just a fluky thing. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. No. So, but, but it adds up, right? Like, if, if I add up my, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't feel like what I've done is like on the same level as yours. I'm not saying that, but I agree from, from my experience. And, and Chandler, would you agree? The earliest buck I've ever killed was October 15th, and I got lucky on him. Like That's I just, interesting. I just happened to be on a, a ridge that was dropping acorns and smoked a giant on October 15th. And I was 17 years old. Like all my bucks that I shoot are October 20 and, and on. Mm -hmm. Eric, Doug, what about you guys? Like what in your experience? Like if we add it up here, I don't think I ever killed a big buck in October. No, mine was, uh, well, the eight and a half year old was the only October buck. October 30th. Yep. Something like that. I mean, so yeah, it kind of adds up. To kind of be we don't we range. don't have a lot of early season experience, I guess, when it yeah. comes to killing big deer. I'm not saying it can't be done. Like if I My if I had the right it. weather where I could get out of the combine and hunt in early October, and I had a giant using a food source and he was predictable, I'd go out and kill him in early October. I've just never been able right. to do it. My the earliest I've ever killed like a big buck would be um, October 17th. Yeah, would be my biggest. So I had a, an encounter with a deer that you know is one of those. He'll be a top 10 of my lifetime deer um, experiences. And that was probably October 10th to 12th, somewhere in there. But it was all based on weather at that point. We had an right. early cold front come in, went out in the afternoon. Uh, he came into a food plot, didn't get a shot at him, but it, it was, uh, you know, had, had an encounter with him. Right. But it was 100% based on the fact that we had an early cold front. Was that last year or the year before where early October was like, Really cold last and it, this last season. Yep, and then it got hot again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I tagged out, and I think that's the only reason why I tagged out. It was bizarre weather, weather. here. Yeah, because yeah. we had uh, I'm I'm drawing blanks, but um, mid late October it was like beautiful, mm -hmm. perfect hunting weather, and then I'm like, man, guy, you guys are gonna. I tagged out, got lucky, and I'm like, you guys are gonna murder it in November, and then it got hot, yeah, like hot, hot. hot. Then I was like, fuck, because I hunted Indiana during that time, and I'm yep. like, this sucks. <laughs> but, so, I mean, that's that's an interesting point we all bring up here. But, you know, October 1st, you had the fluke situation, but, I mean, what if we broke down our math just with us, ignore everybody else in the game, October 15th would be the earliest you'd make any crazy moves, really? I mean, for the most part. If it's, you know, the, the, my kind of rule of thumb in my mind is I'm not going to go after a deer. I'm not going to go into the timber, start hunting really hard on anything before October 25th, unless there's a, a cold front that comes through that's abnormal. You know, right. you're getting lows in the upper thirties or mid thirties. Right. Then I'll try to get on them. Okay. Hmm. So even if you, you got a buck, you know, about late July, come all the way into mid-October, you're not thinking about making any serious moves unless crazy weather fronts or something mm -hmm. strange until the end of October. Yeah, I just, I don't see the, uh, I think the, the potential for killing that deer is so small that 
he's in the play, he's in the farm. Why screw it up? Why okay. do anything? Well, let me That's ask you this: answer. at that point, what, at what date ish? Mm -hmm. I know there's always a buffer because you mm -hmm. can't ever call the date. Like that's just you can't do it. At what date ish are you kind of worried about losing him on his predictability for the chasing of the rut? I, I'm not. I'm not, not worried, worried about, about it at all. No, I mean, so to me, you to kill big deer, big bucks. I think, especially when you're hunting the same property consistently, you just have to really know your does. Know, you know? your does. Okay. Yeah. Um, I so, like that. I'm writing that down, actually. Yeah. So you have to kind of understand where they're feeding at during the year, what they're doing. Um, and then if you have pockets of overly mature does, it seems like for whatever reason, the mature does come into heat first. Mm -hmm. So it's when one of those mature does comes in. The MILFs, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that might be... Uh, Air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> the MILFs. Yeah. So that might be your best chance and your only chance at some of these mature deer. I mean, well, because once they get locked down with a, with a doe, then it's just they're cycling in and out and you got to get lucky at You're that playing point. playing that game, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you if you can, October 25th, 20, I've killed a lot of deer October 27th. I've killed a lot of good ones October 29th, 30th. Um, that first week when the does start coming in, even maybe just before they start coming in and the bucks are like, we know it's getting close. We know it's going to be time. They're going to be out there checking them. Yeah. That's probably the best, right? Just like get them as they're coming into heat. Yeah. That's what the bucks I'm looking are for. smelling it. Everyone's getting all horned up and yep. weird. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of like Doug. Everyone's getting excited. Doug, what's up? He killed me October 1st, probably. <laughs> <laughs> too predictable, son. Yeah. Damn. Doug's way too predictable. But you know, we, so Big Creek Bottom Farm and middle of October, we start having scrapes showing up down in the bottoms pretty hard. And yeah. 10 years ago, I would be on those scrapes. I would be down there October 15th, October 20th. And maybe you're going to catch one coming in at dark, but it's still so dang hot that they're going to catch you. They're going to wind you. Yeah. And you screw it up. And, and it's just, you're so much better to leave those deer alone, wait till they come to you and, and just catch them when they're, their guard's down. You must yeah. have owned this farm for a while, huh? Yeah. We've owned it for a little over twenty years. Yeah, so you got it figured out. I, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but but the thing, everything, even that, you know, that does help. But what you're saying is, it's it's all true because I'm learning that more and more as I go. Is like I'm, you know, I I feel I still feel like a kid. Uh, I don't know if I still am considered a kid. I feel like one, but I still feel like a little bit like the young kid when I was like learning bow hunting when I'm like sixteen, seventeen. I'm doing hunts on my own, like. I see a scrape and I'm like, I'm gonna fucking hang it, stand right over this motherfucker. I'm gonna kill this buck tomorrow. Oh, yeah. yep. You know Done what I mean? Deal. Like, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Flexing, you know? Sometimes less, sometimes you just have to thank less and do it. But yeah, that's that is true. the thing, too, is like, as I get older and a little more experience and like have a family and I'm busier with the podcast and blah, 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 right. it goes on and on. I just find that if I calculate my I really weather is what changed a lot for me. And uh, like DeerCast did help me a lot in the last couple mm -hmm. of years, but and and we don't get paid by DeerCast. I'm just saying that that's like the tool that I use. But it, it's, I mean, you can look at a regular weather station and see the same thing that DeerCast does. But this breaks it down for a deer hunter, and it just makes me think about things, or maybe helps my anxiety. Like um, I don't know, I'm sure you guys get the same anxiety I get. I might be at a pumpkin patch with the fam, which is great. I want to do that stuff. I'm not saying I don't want to do that, but I'm like, fuck. The weather is really good, honey. I, I'm I'm out. Got a I'm high out. pressure system coming in. I've got to go. <laughs> Fuck these pumpkins. I got to go. Fuck these pumpkins. They're just orange. orange. What's up? They'll be orange next year too. Guess what? They're gonna be dead in two weeks. What's yeah. up? Yeah, yeah. What's up? Talk to me. So you're almost better to just calculating your time, knowing what you know, go in with your confidence, calculate your time. And I don't, I don't know any other way to break it down. But it's, but less is more, really. Right. But you have to be smarter about your less is more because if your less is more, like Steve would have put in less is more, then just less is <laughs> a fucking lot less. Then, then less is just way less. <laughs> less is not doing shit. Yeah. Less is just sticking it in your own butt at that point. You know. <laughs> so you have to like calculate. <laughs> it's <laughs> and you're in your own bottle. Your own your own yeah. You know what I'm saying. I don't know how else to explain that. No, I think that's right. I mean, pick your times <laughs> Thank and, you make for... it, and make it count, right? <laughs> so when you go in, you want, it, you want it to be a day where you're like, you know what? I think there's more than a 50% chance there's going to be a good one that shows up wherever I'm going in and I'm going to make it count. Yeah. You don't want to be yeah. like, you know, mm, 
it's going to work 10% of the time every time. Uh, I'm going to go give it a shot. No, because you're just going to do more damage. You just don't want to go in there all nimbly bimbly from no. tree to tree. You but, know? I, but I feel like I go in every season and I'm like, October 10th, I'm going to wax a big boy early and just get one out of the way and like, be like fuck yeah, I got one. I got to do it before October 10th. So year. October 10th, yeah, you, you should be, <laughs> you should be uh, working on your does at that time, right? Yeah. Early season. Like that's, that's another big key on our farm. Right now, fringing, I'm, right? I'm inventorying all the does, and uh, we're we're getting a hit list together because what we like to do is we like to take the ugly does out because you know all the bucks like to be around the, the pretty ones. Does. Yeah, you gotta yeah. take them but, thick ones out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> them thick girls. <laughs> shout, shout out to my thick girls. I didn't mean anything against. <laughs> holla, holla, holla! Hey. I, I don't have a track for that. <laughs> I was going to hit a button. You just got the turkey Why, gobble. Got the I almost right hit here. this one, but it, that was the wrong button. Hello, hello, hello. That came off bad. You don't hit the laughing yeah. one. I meant, uh, that's all there I got. There we go. There it is. <laughs> I'm an idiot. And I apologize for that. Well, we all are, so it's okay. But all right, yeah. So, but but uh, what I'm getting at is like, I'm tempted to make aggressive moves early. Can, can I just say something here? So Please if somebody do. really has the desire to go out and kill one like early October, if you have access to a farm and you can set it up to where you got like some kind of a kill plot or an easy way to get in and out and just hunt a fringe and like you got a scrape or whatever that you're watching in the early season and he's just hammering it, then go hunt it. You know, if, it, if you're not blowing your farm out and you can get in and hunt a fringe and it's a you know, one in three chance where you might see this buck, then I'd go in and make a move on him. Yeah. If somebody really feels aggressive in that early season and all the stars line up where the barometer's right and you got a cold front and you're on the fringe and you're not going to hurt anything, dude, by all means, go, go in and hunt it. that deer. But yeah. I'm yeah. just saying, like, looking at my personal career and everybody else that's in here, it's not a high probability hunt for us. It, it's. I agree. I think that's great that you pointed that out. And we're not saying you can't go and kill one opening day. October 5th, like a guy out here just uh, west the of us. love it. I mean, yeah. the first two weeks of October is their killing time. Yeah, It's that's, just, for me, I'm not used to it. Agreed. I think the opportunity is there depending on a lot of circumstances. Yep. Um, that's up to you to make those calls. I mean, it might work out big for you. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to go blow my farm out the first two weeks of October on a half ass chance. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm with you on this. Like... If I'm not hunting an edge or a food plot that's on the very outskirts of my farm, I'm probably not going to be sitting trying to kill a big deer. I will tell you this. Last season, I didn't go inside the timber at all. Neither did I. Yep. Yeah. Sometimes that's like that's a smart play. And I know everybody's situation is a little different. There may be people who have a farm that five other people have access on, and they don't show up until October 20th, and you want right. to get in there and yep. make the most of it. Like you said, I mean, if you everyone's, have a good beat ev- on it. Everyone's you know. situation is different. Absolutely. Property's different. Absolutely. Their, their and, layout and, and everything. Not everybody's holding out for a 160 or better. I mean, right. if you want to go in there and you've got a bunch of deer hitting a food plot and you just want to get an arrow in a deer, go get them. Go get them. Yep. Yeah, right. absolutely. absolutely. Right, definitely. So moving into our, our, uh, November, mm-hmm. if you got a buck your pattern, you're not concerned about the, um, the sporadicness, if that's even a word, of the rut. No. Um Again, it comes back to the MILFs. Well, I guess, yeah, at that point, that's what their (laughs) main concern is. But it comes back to letting deer be comfortable where they're at. You know, you want to give them that space that they feel safe. And regardless of if he's in the middle of a lockdown with a doe two miles away and in the middle of, you know, a, a ditch somewhere, if he comes back to that place, I don't care if it's October 4th, October 17th, or December 3rd. Like, I want to have those spaces where the bucks want to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're just giving them giving them their time, giving them their space, giving them the environment. For sure. And uh, no pressure. No really. pressure. And the thing I've found is the older the deer are, the smaller areas that they're going to use. Um, you know, you may have a six-year-old or a seven-year-old buck that he only uses 40 or 50 acres. And that's just his zone. And he doesn't come yeah. out of that except for the rut. He probably right. just, I, I mean... If I'm thinking like a big buck, he knows that area in and out. He's comfortable there. Why move? Right. He lives there. He walks it every day. Yeah. Yep. It's his living room. Yep. Let's jump to uh, some social media questions. Sure. Kind of see what we got. I'm going to start with Instagram first here since last episode we started with Facebook first. Uh, shout out to Instagram. And uh, we're going to go with Wade's question because he's at the top here. Uh, any light bulb moments that happened while on a hunt that stand out from the rest? That's a good question. It is, it is a good question. And, you know, 
I wish that it was as easy as just saying, you know, here's two or three things that all of a sudden that just take you from shooting 120 and 130s to 150 and 160s, you know, but unfortunately, I don't think that there's any one thing. The biggest thing I would say I've taken away from killing big deer is looking back on it, you just have to be very patient. Uh, don't go in there chasing them too hard unless you really have a good idea and a good plan of what you're trying to do. Uh, you know, when I was first starting out, I'd sit in a stand for a half an hour in the morning when the sun came up and nothing's coming through. Well, I'm going to go to them and I'd get down and I'd walk around the timber and I'd blow everything out of there. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, you learn through mistakes a lot of times and I learned through a lot of mistakes. And that led me to the point of saying, you know, you got to sit there and you got to wait on them. And you may have a day that you think is going to be perfect and they don't show up. Well, for whatever reason, they didn't show up. Get out of there. Don't freak out. Don't worry about it. You may not have done anything wrong. You probably did the exact right thing. Wait, come back and get them again the next time. Yeah. That's so, really good advice. It is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, patience is the biggest thing to me on, on big deer. Man, that's, I mean, I agree from my experience. And I'm, not killing, I'm not killing though. 198s, but <laughs> I'm going to write this down. Patience in all caps. Patience is key. I can't spell patience. There was there was one day I was talking to a guy that um, when I was in high school, he was one of my coaches, and he was telling me how he was a big deer hunter. And um, I said, you know, what's the key to killing big bucks? He said, well, you can't kill big bucks where they don't live. You know, so if you're on a farm and there's nothing big there, you probably need to find another place to go if yeah. that's what you're looking for. Yeah, I've always we've always kind of uh, well, not always, but frequently we've broken that down as like. You know, if you live in a spot where all you're doing is complaining about your quality of deer and you're doing nothing to change it, mm -hmm. then you should, over time, probably whittle out your complaints of not being able to kill big deer. Because if that's truly what you care about, you will find big deer. But it's even, the same thing. Go it, ahead. No, I was just going to say even more specifically, like even if you're in our area, like an area that has big deer and you're not seeing the caliber of deer that you want, you know, get permission, make moves. You know, you got to find that big deer in order to kill them. If you're hunting in a, in a, on a farm that doesn't have the caliber and the caliber of animal that you want, you're not going to be successful. Well, that's the thing too. Like that also applies, you know, it goes to, you know, you want to kill a big elk. Well, you're not going to kill it here. Yeah. No, you have right. to go out West to kill a big elk. Yeah. Right. Like that just, they don't live here. And that, I think that's kind of what you're saying too, Austin is, you know, the hustle that people miss out. And uh, when we had Jeremy Beck on that episode and we were at a uh, club 200 at Ross's place, he's, and he's from Wisconsin, he comes down and he's like, I would not want to want to hunt Illinois He goes, your public sucks because there's so many people you can't get private. You can't get permission pieces. You're paying out the ass for leases, but you, I give you guys credit because you guys are grinding it out to figure out spots. Yeah. You got to hustle. You, you know, trade shit, offer work, offer, offer labor, offer this, offer that, pay for a lease, do this. So, and that's what sucks about like the podcast game or the video game now is like people are like public or private, public. It doesn't really, that's not really an accurate comparison really anymore, especially where we're at in Illinois because, or in Iowa even. Um, mm -hmm. I was a little different because you guys aren't over the counter for non residents. Illinois right. is. But people don't understand that. It's like, if you knew about the fucking hustle that it takes for us to get private ground or permission pieces, you would eat shit because you don't right. understand some of the things that I have to do to get my pieces. I don't own ground. Yep. You know? I don't either. And, and Eric doesn't, and Doug doesn't. And and so what I do to kill my bucks that I'm very proud of is a lot of hustle. And a lot of I'm doing a lot of shit that a lot of people aren't willing to do. You know, I, I, all we got to do is get my wife in here and get some public land guy to interview my wife, and she'll fucking tell you about right. <laughs> some of the shit I do. You know? Hey, I ran auger cart for a lot of years to be able to hunt some of the ground there you I go. do. And that's a hustle because you're working through hunting season. Oh, yeah. yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that, which, you know, and, and I have nothing against people because they just don't know. Right. You know, it's nothing against someone that's going to give a shit and they didn't realize it. But once they do realize it, it's like, oh, fuck, I guess I didn't realize, that, you know, just because we're hunting private ground, we're still busting our asses to get permission on pieces and Absolutely. whatever it may be. Like it's not a yeah, go on in, and then I kill a twenty, a hundred and eighty inch buck, right? In five days of sitting, that don't right. happen. I've never killed a hundred eighty inch buck, and I've hunted Illinois for since I was twelve, eleven. It is cool though to see like I mean public ground around us. There's just one of my farms. I got to pass up some public ground and. 
you know, over the last couple of years, there's a lot more trucks there and it, it, it kind of sucks. There's so many people in there, yeah. but it's cool too, to see so many people are getting back into it during bow season. I mean, yeah, there's one spot, I mean, it's a couple hundred acres and there'll be 20, 30 trucks there, you know, end of October into November, which would suck if you were hunting that ground. But at the same time, it's cool to see that many people that are still passionate about it and out there hunting and hustling. Yeah. No, that is cool. That's yep. cool. Um, Johnny Johnson asked, shout out to this guy. He's a great dude. Uh, our bouncer. He's our, one of our bouncers at work. <laughs> really class. good. Uh, we need to get him some security sign <laughs> or, uh, like shirts. What's the most important sign to get excited about? Uh, rub scrapes, big tracks, etc. And how do you personally hunt the sign? Good question. Um, and I don't get into the timber too much during the actual season. Um, I've got a pretty good idea if there's a good deer in there, so I'm not worried about where he's scraping, where he's rubbing, where he's doing his thing. I'm just trying to intercept him when he's coming out to a hot doe, mm -hmm. during the rut at least. And then maybe late season, I'll hunt some hot food sources if I still have a tag. And, you know, I specifically set up a lot of my food plots for late season just so that I have a spot to, to you know, attack those deer. To go when the going gets tough. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's close to some good thermal cover, and I just make it easy for them to just set up shop and slip in and, and try to kill them in the winter, but Absolutely. late winter, late season. But um, if I'm if, – so as far as specifically the sign, what do I get most excited about? Late season or, or after the season's over, shed season, I want to see the big rubs. You know, I mean, that, that to me just is like, damn – you so even it. after the season, during sure. shed season, when you're walking the timber, yep, big rubs is what's they turn me on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's <laughs> what you like, huh? Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> That's to get yeah. you going, huh? It's usually yeah. not a little guy doing for that. sure. Yeah, you know, you, you walk up on a tree that's the size of a telephone pole or something, and it's all shredded up. You're like, okay, there, okay. that wasn't a two and a half year old. No, yeah. that wasn't a spike doing that. <laughs> no, uh -uh. six to midnight, real yeah. fast. That wasn't yeah. Timmy out there doing that. You know, that's right. Yeah, that's what we like. That's what we like mm -hmm. to hear. How you doing? But you know, kind of in in same sense of uh thinking with looking at these sh um rubs and the sign after the season's already over a lot of times there's areas in my farm that internally uh there may not be cell signal or whatever so i can't put cell cams in there mm -hmm. but i'll set trail cameras in there and just leave them all season long just to see what deer were coming through if it's deer i knew about if there's a deer i don't know about that came through and just get some intel on those deer not until maybe february or march after the right. season, just to so know for the following yep. year. Yep. Interesting. Yep. yep. I, I think these big deer, you have to be way ahead of them. You can't chase the sign. You can't chase what they did last week. That might be the biggest fucking tip that you drop. Totally. And and that's one of those things that we got out of you that we didn't like really intentionally mean to get out of you. So, sure. But I'm gonna give Johnny that credit there. I will say I, I've done that too, but I that usually happens when I forget about the camera and where I put it. Right. <laughs> I want to write that down, but I don't know how to write it down. You're just thinking about what, so a big deer on your farm, you're thinking about what he's done in years prior. Right. Or if you catch a new deer on your farm right. and it's December, February, whenever, you think, okay, that deer was on this farm in February, so you're going to try to get ahead of him the following the year. Following sure. year. So yeah. late season, you're setting up trying so to kill him. You're taking intel for the next. Yeah, and, and this season. isn't just five year olds. I mean, I'll see if there's a three year old that I'm like, hmm, look at him. He's got yeah. forked brow tines and long G3s. Like next year, he might he's be. He's been here. on this ridge in the third week of October every year for the last two or three years. I guess I know where I, I you know, that's a weakness in his armor. Right. You can right. you can go after that. And it's kind of uncanny how often these big deer, will, or not even big deer, just deer in general, will repeat themselves. Like once they find a little niche on your farm that they like, yep. it's kind of weird when you can look back at the time of year and say, well, he was there last year and now here he is here again in the same place. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. kind of brings up an example of a deer that I'm interested in. I got trail cam pictures of a deer at a certain time. And I'm not gonna, I'm not giving specifics here for many reasons, but... Um, the crew here all knows, and Todd, you even know, but yep. you just don't know. Maybe you do, or maybe you don't know what deer I'm talking about. There's a deer that I'm very interested in, and he was very hard to figure out. And then I had like a uh, a third eye opening of like, ah, oh, shit. I tagged out. I was like, I could kill that deer like in the next three days, and I just whatever, you know. It's, it's I'm happy. I'm tagged. It is out. what it is. But I realized like, ah, oh, that deer is killable. Like in the next three days, and it's probably over. And I realized it. It was over after checking trail cams after the fact. And Austin, you made a good point too, kind of like what we're talking about. And I didn't even realize it until now. 
Well, you know, if that deer made those moves, then you should probably set some stands this summer and prep in preparation for the deer to make the same moves come late October this season. So you, if he does, you know, if he doesn't, he doesn't. But if he does, you're going to be pre- damn fucking prepared. happy that you prepared for him to make Absolutely. the same moves that he did the year prior. Absolutely. So that's a good point. And I didn't even honestly, as obvious as it may seem, I didn't put two and two together because there's so much information you can absorb with all this that certain um, clues and details and all that get lost in all this. But that's like two things I literally just put together. That might be the, the difference of me killing the buck that I want to kill this season and not killing it because um, it's easy to ignore things you took note of mentally and didn't write down or things you saw on a trail cam last season. You're like, oh, and that, that you can forget about by the time late season hits, trade show season for us, prepping for summer, Western hunts, then back into whitetails. There's a ton you can forget right, in that time frame. So that might be, in my opinion, that's my favorite pick for tip of the tip of the episode as of now so far as of now so, so far yeah well so in in on that same train of thought too you know you see a mature buck do something you identify there's a weakness there and you know you can plan on that right yeah for that individual for the individual yeah. the thing that i've found is on our place mature bucks that it's it's almost like there's five or six different like approaches that they'll take towards our farm and if I find a deer in a certain spot at a certain time of year, there's a good chance he's going to show up in a different spot. And and it's generational. Like the mature bucks use the farm the same way, generation after generation after generation. So even if you don't end up killing that deer <clears throat> next year, in three years, there might be a new buck that comes through and, and he approaches the land the same way that this one did. And you may end up killing him. That's, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. And it's got to just be because of... Uh, the mindset, right? Like their knowledge and experience and like what the ground, how the ground works for them. Right. Absolutely. Is it in relation to a doe group that lives there? Is it in relation to a food source that's out there? I mean, I, I'd love to say, I know exactly why they make the decisions that they make, but all I can do is just react to what well, I mean, look at this God, way. That's fucking as, interesting. as a new hunter, you're going to go in there all not knowing what the hell you're doing. And you're bumping them five years down the there. road. You know how to access that property and what works for you versus the deer. Yeah. You know, and going yeah, back hopefully. to that yeah. that comment I made earlier about how I made I learned a lot through making mistakes. I mean, it's it's as small as I've gone in to areas I liked and had a stand in a tree. I'd go in and I'd hunt that area, and seventy five percent of the time something would catch my wind. But I just loved the area, so I'd shift fifty yards one way or another, and for whatever reason, the way that wind came up that draw or over that ridge or whatever, all of a sudden that tree was the magic tree that you could be in, you could access, you could get out of, you could hunt, and it wouldn't impact the area the same way. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you got to fine tune and keep screwing up and keep making mistakes yeah. and just a sh- shift here, adjust there, and eventually you just kind of get it tuned in. Yeah. God, that's a good that's tip huge. too, man. Yeah. It's like, I, I feel like a lot of people are scared to do that, like experiment, like move. Even if it's 50 yards, some people might roll their eyes, it's too much work. Right. To move that far, you know, or yeah. whatever. But or it's like they killed the buck out of that stand already. So, like, man, look at Johnny there filtering off on some fucking, he just got us off on some deep <laughs> shit. <laughs> Good oh, job. Man. It was funny. Uh, Wade and I actually went up in my man cave earlier today and we were talking about this. He's like, So, where'd all these deer come from? I'm like, It's funny when you sit here and look at them. I think I counted six or seven of my big deer all came within a 150 yard circle. Like, I've just got this area on this farm, the big draw. You've heard me talk about it before. Yeah. Sometimes you just find those spots. I think topography just favors those mature animals, and they're just every year you can count on a big deer being in there. And if you can get in, sneak in and out without alerting them, you're, you've are you got a really good chance of being successful in that exact spot well, every year. And we've seen that, yeah. too, with Doug and I. Like, there will be, you know, three ridges, you know, and there's that one – that the deer just love. I don't know the mm-hmm. difference between the three, but there's that one that they just love to travel on. You know, you know, when you mentioned that Austin, it's because I'm starting to like, I feel like I'm grow. I've grown a lot in the last several years of hunting five of the bucks in the last three years where they, I kill two bucks a year are from, I mean, honestly, a hundred yard radius. Yep. I know where you're talking. Cause I helped you drag one out. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's weird too because Eric said that like that one ridge we kill our bucks off of, uh, it's just like a magical ridge. But it also changes when there's beans or corn in that field. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. just it's just weird how it works. Yeah, it's 
I, that's what I love about whitetails, man, is because, I mean, it's, you know, it, maybe we'd have be having this same conversation if we lived in Nevada or Utah or Wyoming about For elk, sure, for sure. You know, because we'd all be methodical about it and whatnot. But um, it's just, that's what's so fun about whitetails is, like, everybody has different experiences, and they're mm-hmm. so malleable as, like, a species. Like, you could be inner city hunting. You could be deep country hunting. You could be, you know, river bottom hunting. You could be plains whitetail hunting, like – it's so much fun to talk about them and the, you can break down all these like methodical breakdowns and everybody has a different experience. If you're, you know, 40 miles this way or a hundred miles into Iowa or into Indiana. Well, and that's, what's like, crazy just about this podcast right now. Todd's throwing out things that like, I would probably never even think of like, that's what's nice yeah. about a podcast. You get to hear everyone's aspect yeah. on how they're hitting their property or what they're doing, which is super cool. Yeah. No, I love, I love this type of conversation. Right. Um, let's see. I'm gonna, I'm kind of just going to read them. If we've covered them, we've covered them. Um, that we kind of covered this. I'm going to read any when targeting a specific buck, what specifically are you trying to key in on and how do you decide when to make your move? We've sort of covered mm-hmm. this. I'm looking for his girlfriend, looking for his girlfriend, yep. the late, MILF, the late MILF. October, early November. All right. Um, where's the babes at? Yep. Cha-ching. <laughs> Uh, slot machine sound. Blue line bow hunter just said that's a hog of a buck on your photo, and it absolutely is. And we're reading these uh, these questions from the Instagram post that we posted of Todd on his giant last year. Beautiful picture, by the way. Thanks. That was in the studio in uh, December. Um, I touched it. This is uh, yeah. We we all touched it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's his name here? I can't read it. Cabinet Todd. Cabinet Todd. Hell, I say just keeping the conversations flowing. That's where all the great information comes from. Where else are you going to hear about whiskey wind, peacocking, and puke bucks, etc.? <laughs> that was a fantastic episode. Damn puke bucks. Thanks, brother. Yeah, we got to get Chancey back on. Um, in the works, PR Paletta has uh, I, I, I'll give you guys a teaser. I talked to PR Paletta from, from Whitetail Journal, and, and uh, there's an alter ego in the works for the podcast. Oh, geez. Oh, boy. It's uh, dangerous. Oh, boy. It's going to be dangerous. Um, J Shaft 44. I'd love to hear Ross, the Lord, and Mark Luster breaking it down. Oh, he's talking about just a different episode. Cool, but well, we could probably make that happen. Get Mark Luster on, probably. Um, Corey Smith, Bowhunter Die, Mock Scrapes, or no? Always curious as to what people's views are on them. We might only hit Instagram on this on this episode. A lot of good questions here. Yeah, that is a good question. And, you know, the first real big mature deer I killed was actually over a mock scrape, October 29th, um, 1999. And so I'm I was a, nine years old. For yeah. Yeah, same, same here. Same Am I here. dating myself? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a youth hunt, right? No. <laughs> I'm, right, I'm right there with you, man. It was uh, a youth hunt. <laughs> um, you guys so, are the old OG. You guys are the old heads. Yeah, of for the sure. Game. No, I respect you. For yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, they can work in the right situation. I think, you know, again, these deer are such individuals that certain bucks may take to a mock scrape and just be completely drawn in and totally killable. <clears throat> and others may be like, that's yeah, fuck that. not my thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. totally. Yeah. Yeah. Todd, what do is you, that piece of shit? Do you use mock scrapes like in the earlier part of the season to try to take any inventory with a camera? Mm, I have not, no. no. Now, now, one thing that I did try last year and I'm just kind of getting into – are the uh, the rope scrape? Yep, deals. that's what I the vine. Yeah, yep. what about, exactly. What about like horizontal scrapes? Haven't gotten into that yet either, but it's definitely something to think about and try to develop. I mean, hey, I'm I'm all for any kind of approach you want to take to try to give yourself an edge, and I don't think doing any of that stuff's going to hurt anything. Yeah, they may not respond to it, but I don't think it's going to blow up the area. Like fuck and them up, or I don't that, think so. And yeah. there's only one way to find out. You that's just right. got to go out there and do it. You know? yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, in Illinois, we don't we can't use feed. So, in a lot of the early season, if I'm not like on a field edge, I'll try to set up like I'll put the vine up or whatever, or I'll try to make a little bit of a mock scrape to kind of take some inventory in the early season. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. And I haven't really perfected my method on my mock scrapes yet. So that's why I was curious. I didn't know if you had had any experience with that. What I'll do more than make a mock scrape is there's certain areas where there's scrapes every single year under the exact same licking branch. Mm -hmm. 
And you can get pictures of the deer this time of year going through there and just working their Checking face on that, that yep. branch, you know. So. Right. The glands yep. and all that in there. Exactly. Eyes. The big community spot. Yeah. I've exactly. wanted to been I've wanted to try the rope and I've been wanting to try like the horizontal. I, I have not had a ton of success with mock scrapes. Like it's it's something I'm like, I'm gonna do that this year. And then I get to it and then I'm like, dude, fuck this. Like, yeah. I, I'm just to be harsh about it. Like I'm just like, nah. I'm good. Like well, it didn't work for me. I don't know. When Maybe we're sitting I'm setting here, up and, wrong. yeah. When we're sitting here in July talking about deer season, it's like I want to do decoys and I want to do horizontal right. rubs and I want to do this and that and this and and then the season gets here and it's like over. I you didn't know? do any it's of that. So yeah. quick. Yeah. Yeah. I dude. It's it, as an adult, time flies so quick. Yeah. When I was a kid in summer, I didn't have to do shit. Right. I'm like, it's 4th of July. I got tons of summer left. And then I'm like, back to school. I didn't do fucking anything. <laughs> I play right. Call of Duty all summer. I know. Yeah. And so I'm like, man, the days. The days. <laughs> um, if you only knew what you knew now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wouldn't be good. Could be killing big My life would be different yeah, in a lot of ways. I'd have like 40 kids. Um, <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, shit. Here we go. AJ Wizza, best advice for hunting over water holes and also any info on hunting over honey locust trees. That's an interesting uh, question. question. Yeah. yeah. Um, the water hole thing seems to be super popular right now, and I haven't really gotten into it. I have a major creek that rolls through the center of my property, so water is not really an issue for me on my place. Um, yeah, you can get it whenever, whenever. Yeah, whenever. yeah. I mean, now there may be some spots up on top of some ridges where it may make sense to put a little dammed up yep. draw to just to give them something to key on. Um, but I'm again, I'm out on the edges, so I'm not really trying to hit those spots. Um, honey locust trees. I actually do have a portion of my farm that's honey locust hedge and and bush honeysuckle and late late winter if there's not much other food they'll come in and eat those pods Mm -hmm. yeah but Mm -hmm. um it's funny watch them suck down a whole locust pod yeah that long they love that much and they do yeah but it's got to be pretty dang cold and not many other options for them yeah Yeah, like heat and bark pretty much um this is a cool question james dean's trouble sorry instagram names are hard to read what is the crew's biggest three keys success slash three most important things they have for a set? Weather, gear, time of year, et cetera. What is the crew's biggest three keys to success? Three most important things they have for a set. Well, for me, it's going to be knowing that there's a big deer in the area. Yeah. Can we go pressure? We could probably all agree on right yeah well i think i think you hit it right there just not even pressure just locating a big deer for one so you're actually hunting the caliber animal that you want is right. step number one you kind of know yeah. how much pressure to apply or not and then yeah. where to go from just there. finding that yep. big animal is number so, one so, all right well number one finding a big deer mm-hmm. yep yep number two for me would be i guess it's kind of a combo two and three put them together the right weather at the right time of year you know the, the right weather and probably pressure together Mm, Is that I'm fair? just I'm just looking for a cold front that last week of October, first two weeks of November. Okay, and, and that comes with pressure, sure, because you're not making dumb moves before because right. you're waiting on that front. Yep, yep. So that's kind of like two in the same. Right, weather and pressure is kind of like you're you're not going in there for a hope for the hill Mary. Correct. Right. On an eighty degree day. Right. Because you you know better at this point. Yeah. So at, at this at this time period in the podcast we're swirling pressure and weather fronts and right. timing into the same rope right okay so we'll count that as two that's i am I'm, I'm in i'm in on this one and two right or am i off no you're good you're good you're good three so, keys to success we're trying just I mean, we're simplifying here what would be you, number three you gotta have your bow with you right i mean <laughs> i'm not sure what the third one is. arrows release bow Shoot um, your bow you know, before uh, season. I say entry and exit strategy, yeah, which yeah. also kind of goes into pressure, but kind of not because you can you can stay out of an area and not have pressure and your weather fronts right, but if you're sloppy on your execution, you're kind of going <laughs> to shoot yourself in the foot. You're going to put your uh, what's your wind fall under pressure too? I say wind would fall under your entry and exit. Yeah, yeah. And then but you but it's good. It's good we didn't overlook that. That's a good point. And you know something about wind. Um, in, in Ross's recovery video, he actually touched on it. A lot of spots to get a big deer to come in, you're going to have to have almost the exact wrong wind. Like a 10 or 15 degree shift in the wind direction is exactly what it takes for that deer to come in. Because, you know, Ross said that that deer winded him and was getting out of there when he shot him. 
if the wind would have been blowing the complete opposite direction, good chance that deer never even shows up there. Right. right. And the guy who changed the way I, I will give him credit forever on this. My thought process on process on that is Clark Cummings. He talked about um, quartering winds. Yep. What we call a whiskey wind mm-hmm. on the Kyle Weeder podcast is uh, the wind's got to work for the deer. Yeah. Yep. Otherwise, he has no reason to be there. That's right. So the deer, a deer will seldom move with the wind to his back in a critical situation of survival. That's how they survive, you know. Another thing, too, real quick, is like what uh, Drury said was, if it's downpour rain and you know it's going to stop that afternoon, you better be in that stand. When it's raining, as soon as it stops, you'll see deer. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me... Uh, what's this little deal here? Um, we, a lot of this we've covered. I'm trying to... I want to get everybody's questions here. How much pressure is too much pressure? And I ask because I, because you can't figure out what a big one is doing without a little scouting or time in the stand because trail cams don't tell you everything. We, we kind of covered, covered that. Yeah, we kind of yeah. covered that. Um, no, they don't. But, I mean, uh, that's a good – in general, how much pr- – and, and I'm kind of – I'll ask you – this is to you, Todd, directly, but kind of to the crew as well. How much pressure is too much pressure? Um, the amount of pressure that makes that deer uncomfortable, whatever that is. You know, I mean, and that's, <laughs> yeah. I, that's a horrible answer for – you know, it, it doesn't define it, but – um, if you've got trail cameras out on an edge where you can drive your car right up to it or your truck right up to it and check them without having to walk anywhere and leaving a bunch of scent, you can probably do that once yep. every three, four days, whatever, in the middle of the day, right? Yeah. But if you're driving in there and you're busting out a bunch of deer and you're 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 just announcing yourself to the herd or, or specifically to the the big buck that you're after, you you're gonna mess it up. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Agreed. If you've built that farm and you've literally shaped that food plot to the way you want it and you can get in and out of that plot 13 times without alerting that deer, then that's not too much pressure. But if you go in there one time the wrong way and blow him out, then that's too much pressure. Yep. And I have yeah. food plots I've set up that I'm just like, you know what, I am I know that I'm going to go in there. I'm going to be able to get in, but I'm going to screw it up when I come out. I can't hunt this more than once every two or three weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you just got to let it settle down. Yeah. Just as much it, as you want to be in there, you got to let absolutely. it settle down. Yep. Yeah. You just hope it pays off eventually on the right time. That's right. Pretty much, yep. yeah. Interesting, yeah. That's a good... I like that question. I mean, be, I mean, at a certain point, even if we've covered it kind of in conversation, it also helps to um, f- be forced to kind of like simplify it in a way. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, well, we kind of talked about it, but if you had to be like nailed to the wall about it, how would you break it down? Like that's also an important thing, I think, too, for sure. people. Um, because it might make sense to us because we have hunting experience, but I like to break things down for people who might not have as much or have more, but don't understand how we're talking about it. Um, some of these questions, uh, we'll answer this one. Bow Assassin 365. I'd like to hear a bit about more traditional bow hunting. I really like the podcast and I haven't missed an episode since I turned in last spring. One of my favorite episodes is Austin's first trad buck. I swapped from solely compound to solely traditional this last uh, traditional last this past season. There's just a little different mindset, I think. Keep up the good work and shit talking, fellas. Well, we appreciate you, brother. Um, Chandler, this is where you take over. Not really a question in there, but it's kind of, like, kind of a compliment. <laughs> yeah, um, he wants to hear more traditional bow hunting. So we'll, and we'll... shit talking. Hey, Doug, you're a piece of shit. Hey, fuck you, Doug. <laughs> fuck you, Doug. Pick up the trad bow. <laughs> what the fuck, dude? <laughs> Austin, what got you into the trad bow? I, I it's something that I'd always wanted to do for years. Um, I picked up a, I had a bear grizzly recurve in high school, and I wounded a doe with it. And I'm like, man, this is just like. And there was a local guy that had killed a really big deer, and I'm like, that to me is just the pinnacle of the sport like when you can take a literal stick and string and harvest a mature animal with it like to me that was the greatest accomplishment you could do so i kind of put it on the back burner for years and uh, after accomplishing a few of my goals that i wanted to accomplish i'm like well it's time i'm going to pick this thing up and try it so when you are in the trad bow do you have a different shot like practicing session approach than when you're shooting a compound I, I do just because I'm so unfamiliar with it. Like, I mean, most of the time I'm just 15 to 20 yards just going through the shot. I mean, literally 20 times more arrows than I'll shoot through my compound. Just a lot of arrows trying to perfect that shot execution. And uh, 
Yeah, it, it's a lot different than my compound. Where when I, with my compound, I go out and shoot three to fifteen arrows at a time, and with my longbow, I'll go out and shoot fifty arrows at a time. Yeah. Now, now, do you have like uh, do you have like traditional archery stand versus compound archery stand? Some of the stands I use are the same, just because it's a natural pinch or a funnel and those sure. deer are going to be within 10 or 15 yards but a lot of times i'll pack a stand or my saddle in with me and find that pinch that's going to put them within range of me like there's got to be a stand where you're like okay i know i can shoot with my compound there but i wouldn't risk taking my yep i've got some nice i've got some compound stands that are like all right that's probably going to be anywhere from a 10 to a 40 yard shot and right. with with the trad bow i might get a little more aggressive and try to close that gap up a little bit tighter or not even set that spot and set a spot that's just a lot tighter pinch sure makes sure. sense yeah. do you do you have like a height restrict restriction on how high you'll put a stand in for a trad bow normally it's about the same like i like to be up 15 17 maybe yeah. 20 foot right around in there just above the deers like when a deer's looking level he's at about 12 or 13 feet i like to be just up above that 15 foot or a little higher cool right yeah. on I took a pee break at the right time. Sorry, Austin. Get a bush light. I got an apple bush light. Right I got here. I got you one. I got you two beers right here. You got three of them right here. Oof. I can't do an IPA. I got you another oh, one. Right you, there, oh, you're asking me. I thought yeah. you were saying that was for me. Well, there you go. I, well, fuck me, right? <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> All right. Um, Ryan. Ryan Ger. I, have, I can't read Instagram names. Ryan. Just let's just say Ryan. Ryan, thank you. Uh, tactics on secluded parcels with very limited access and best practices for small kill food plots in heavy timber areas. I guess it would depend on the time of year you're trying to get the kill, you know, done. And to me, a small timber area or heavy timber, small, small tract, um, I would think earlier is probably going to be better if the deer yeah. are in there. Um, and to me, more predictable early. Yeah. I just think they'll, you know, when, when the, it, the timbers bare, they can probably pick you off coming in a little bit easier um, than they can early season. You can get you can get pretty tight on some deer early season if you're really sneaky coming in, and the wind's right if it's the right setup. So I would probably just go in with some oats or something on a little food plot, just give them something sweet to come eat, and uh, just get in there when the weather's right. Weather. Yeah. Another weather, thing weather, too, weather. like if you have a secluded parcel, is the screen from Big Time that we just talked about a few podcasts ago. Borderline, baby. Borderline, yep. yep. Uh, that podcast, if you haven't listened to that, tune back in because I think you will enjoy that. It's uh, I learned a shit ton. I think uh, Austin, you shined bright mm -hmm. on that episode a lot. I got lucky, like a diamond. <laughs> I got he lucky. Know, he knows how to grow some seed. <laughs> um, is there a food plot mixture to attract deer when you're competing with alfalfa fields in your hunting area? Um, I would revert you back again to that podcast because yep. i think we covered a ton um i think you get something out of that and a lot of like maybe how to break down um your food plot and entry and exit and all that stuff we talked a lot about that which i think is very valuable um if you're pretty confident a buck is going to stick around your area for the most of the season should you get aggressive early or be more conservative and wait him out <laughs> jeff spear writes yeah, I think we've covered that yep. pretty well. I mean, I'm, you're going to wait him out. I'm waiting him out. Yep. Yeah, yep. definitely. Thanks for the question, Jeff. Appreciate you, buddy. Um, all right. Uh, Holds Claws writes, for newer hunters or those who aren't highly educated on the subject, what can we use to become more adequate with being able to more accurately tell, predict wind direction and thermals to close in on bucks? We touched on this a little bit too, I think. A lot of times, you know, the weatherman might say the wind's coming out of the west, but you got to really get in that spot and test those trees and see what the topography is doing to that exact spot. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Some I did a Whitetail University course with uh, Barry Wenzel one year, and he said that he would go in in the off season and he'd actually put smoke bombs off in his stands. I read an article about that. Yeah, and and, and you know, see weird the things doing. happen. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, watch the smoke a hundred yards out, right? And watch how it cut like a ravine yep. or whatever it may be yeah. and that's a good point too what the wind's doing right at your exact location might not be what that same wind is doing 20 or 30 yards away exactly all right let me throw this at you guys that's great for that educational purpose but 
How many dudes are going to go out with a smoke bomb? Oh, dude, this? that's taking it to the next level. It's the next level. I've never, never put it. on a smoke bomb. <laughs> yeah. You've never no. done it? I, Not I mean, yet. But <laughs> It's got me thinking now. <laughs> but there's guys that'd be like, well, pressure, you smoke the fucking thing out. But do if, it in March. If you're doing yeah. it, yeah, do it in March. Whatever. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, to me, it seems extreme, but you'd learn a lot real you quick. Learn you learn a lot in yep. 10 minutes. You know, honestly, you would. Yep. It's fourth. It's July. Go buy your fucking smoke bombs from the snakes and sparkler stand. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. You know they're real cheap right now because the fourth of July is over. Yeah, light right. light off little snakes in your stand. <laughs> they're the they're giving goes. them away. It's not about what you want. It's the consumer. It's the consumer. Right. Hey, we're about to sell working class smoke bombs for your stand platform. Oh, yeah. hey, no. hey, get a smoke hey, bomb get on that, that expanded hey, metal. Deer, <laughs> hey, deer bombs. <laughs> they're deer bombs. Yeah, eat shit. Listen, buy our marketing. We'll call them deer turds. Um... <laughs> This is a good one. Weekend Warrior Hunting asks, what are some of the biggest struggles or obstacles he had to overcome to be more successful? Which fa- failures did he learn from the most? That's a good question. I think the biggest struggle would be being on a farm, knowing there's big deer there, going in, hunting hard, putting in the time, and not getting results. I mean, that that, yeah, that will huge. burn you up. Because you everything know. you need is there. It's there. You know the deer are there. You're getting pictures of them. You, you may even see them occasionally. Or The equation should be right. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, you, you go in hard early and you pressure these deer and they know they're being hunted and they're just a little bit on edge or really on edge. They become damn near impossible to kill, mm-hmm. you know. So that's probably the biggest struggle I had. And the way I got over it, what, let's see. To be successful, you know, you just, we go back to that patience thing. Um, knowing the deer are there, just have faith that they're going to be there. Mm-hmm. You know, wait yeah. for them, wait for the time to be right, wait for the conditions to be right, and then make your move. Yeah. Trust the process? Absolutely. Yeah. It's more sticking to what you know. Like, once you know it, it's like holding true to it. And yep. even how... Sometimes it can, and painful. it can be hard. Sometimes it can be hard and painful, yeah. All right, we're going to take two more. Um, just for time purposes and kind of where we're at. We've covered a lot of this. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm gonna, right, we'll do three more because this one's funny. Um, <laughs> we can sneak one more in. Bo, Bo Hunting PA asks, uh, how to deal with <laughs> dumbass locals trying to pry and obtain information on your hunting locations. <laughs> Have you had much issues with any of this? Um, I've been pretty tight lipped on most of the stuff that I have going on, so it hasn't yeah. really been much of an issue for me. No, it's it may all changed now that I'm I would tell you this close to you guys, but <laughs> right now, now it's, it's all changing, over. Right? it's all downhill from here. Yeah, right. Next time we invite you on a podcast, you're like, Hey, guys, listen, eat shit. Well, let's yeah. do an elk podcast. Yeah, let's do an elk podcast. <laughs> tell us about New Mexico, <laughs> right? Um, Todd just or South Dakota. I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> I will tell you this I do not rock the working class bow hunter sticker on my truck anymore, on my sure. own truck. Yep, it used to be a badge of honor. Look at my brand. Here's my 15 inch sticker in the back of my window. I had peeled it off. Now yep. it's a beacon. It's a beacon. He just leaves it on when he's in the stand. I don't have any stickers on my new truck. I drive um, a Toyota Tundra now. A Ford Ranger. A red Toyota Tundra, and I got no stickers on the back. I drive a Trail 70, so you won't be able to see it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, it is fun to have a group of guys that you can say, look at this trail cam picture, or oh, I had this encounter, or you want to have some kind of positive feedback from people that are supporting you, you know, but you got to keep it in that circle. Yep. I'll show my homies all day. All day. That's where we're at. Everybody in here is going to see my trail cam pictures, but there's a thing with it that they have to pass the code of hunting brotherhood. Yeah. And uh, Todd, I mean, instantly we passed, I mean, you passed the code of brotherhood, yeah. but, but, but like we both knew like I knew where your code of brotherhood was on the same yep. code as my brotherhood. Same thing with Chandler. Same thing with Eric. Same thing with Doug. Same thing with everybody out in the green room right now. It's like if I go out there, I'm like, check this out. Those dudes are tight lipped, son. Yeah. Dude, for They're- me, it was so weird because I started running trail cameras and I don't know what would it have been. Oh three, oh four. Yeah, I thirty five millimeter. I never shared a picture with anybody. Like literally anybody, not even my own brother. And then when you started up the group where we are, we started talking and kind of sharing pictures. That's like the first time I ever shared 
a picture of a deer that I hadn't killed yet. It just felt weird to me to but, like, but hey, did it ever get out? Did, what's that? Did it ever get out? No, it never did. And that's, what's cool about it. But it just felt weird to let that secret out before I'd actually killed that deer. I've always just been super tight lipped with the deer that I've been hunting. It's, circle it's trust, man. better because it makes in a weird way. It, and, and people listening, but in our community and our friendship, we all have common interests. That makes our friendships a little stronger. Yep. But like, oh, it's fun to share it with somebody. I'm glad that I have that group of people. Right. Yeah. But I never had that. But it don't leave this group. Yeah. One, if if there's a code of ethics, like you share a trail cam picture. If Doug shows a trail cam picture, it don't fucking leave. Yep. Right. The OGs. Like if if it's a buck that that can't get out, and we know when you see the caliber of buck that it can't get out, You're it's like, like oh, shit, Doug. We got you. And we hope you kill that buck. Mm -hmm. And when you call us in a group chat and we're all like fucking hitting the button. <laughs> That's him. It's him. November 3rd, we're like, ah! Even if you're in the stand, when that when that ringer goes off and then you see that, you're like, okay, silent. I'm answering it just so I can see I it. When, Ro <laughs> when Ross did that, uh, was oh, it, it was like a 2 p.m. 2 p.m. It was early, yeah, like three o'clock. Yeah, I was that, in the stands, like you motherfucker. Yeah, <laughs> you just know we killed one. That's our thing. Like we have a we have a couple group chats now during season. If you get a call, and you know it's a group call, silence you, your phone. You, you answer, answer that, that fucker. Even if you're hunting, you just stare at the camera. Even if you're looking for a deer, you're like side eyeing the phone. Like, oh shit, what did what, what yep. did so and so kill? Yeah, yep. that's part of the fun. Um, all right, two more questions. Um, okay, this is a good one. Archer Drive. Big Woods, non ag area tap, uh, tactics to pee or not to pee in scrapes. And most importantly, when is Austin Chandler going to get the rest of the crew into the trad game? <laughs> All right. First question to pee or not to pee in scrapes? I'm peeing. Well, I think it just depends on what, you, what your personal diet is. <laughs> right. <laughs> not asparagus. Well, bucks like bush light. Then. Salty. I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, they, you, we know how good their noses are. Yeah. Right. You know, if, if you drink a shit ton of water. You're probably okay to pee. Yeah, probably. Do you I drink a lot of bourbon, and deer don't seem to mind my piss. <laughs> right, right. A little sweet. A lot of, a lot of bourbon and asparagus. <laughs> asparagus. The only reason I pee in them is because I learned it from these guys. From sure. I'll I, do it all, um, all the time. I've never seriously peed in a scrape and hoping to kill a deer over it. For the record. No, no I do it for trail cameras. Yeah, no. that's like inventory, like weird cameras, like... Not in, I don't go to the big draw and just start pissing in a scrape, but like if I've got a little farm <laughs> that I, I'm just curious, you know, like I want to test this, like, okay, what are the deer going to do? Are they going to react to this? And I've done it a lot and they don't seem to mind it. Like they'll come up and they'll, they'll piss, piss right in it. it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Or you'll have some deer that'll walk right by it and not even give a fuck. And then here's uh when is Austin Chandler going to get there? Well, Todd, we didn't ask you about the, the peeing and scrapes thing. I've done it. it. I've never seen much of a reaction. Don't give a shit. Don't really care. No. I love it. All right. Chandler, when are you going to get us into the trad game? I'm trying. I'm you, guys trying. Are, you guys are all kind of messing around with it a little bit. We've Listen, all got it. When Elite brings back the traditional bows. There you go. We'll fur with it. Elite is our title sponsor. We love they, they Elite. They decide when we start. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Elite. Step up the game. Bring them back. I actually hit them up. I was like, is there any left? Like, can I get one? Come on. Daddy needs one. Yeah. <laughs> we want to rep that brand. Let us do it. They didn't have them. Damn it. But uh, I'm good on that for a while. I got I got to hit a certain level of whitetail for I'm like. But even hit, if you don't hunt with it, they're just so fun to shoot. They're so fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's something about, and Shad, oh, we got some things coming down the line. But if Shad was here, there's something about the community of a traditional bow that just brings people together with fun. You smile. Even when you, you miss, smile. you're having fun. You smile. And yeah. you can see that like at our shoot, like with Shad being around, there's more and more traditional people oh, yeah. showing up. Oh, yeah. everybody's yeah. interested in it. Or, or they're switching over. Yeah. Yeah. Shad is the, is the trad lord. He is. The trad lord. Uh, all right, last question. Um, God, that's not really a question. Give me a sec. That's not a question either. People <laughs> were just plugging things. Another plug. <laughs> that's the last question. Ah shit. Last post. Ah shit. Fuck. It's two. Uh yeah. Okay. I've anyway. got a question. Yeah. How big of a deer is everyone going to kill next year? Oh, wow. Doug, you're first, boy. Come on. Rub that mustache. Let's make predictions. Ooh, I'm feeling really good. If not, oh, we're gonna, okay, let's bring this good. back. Let's bring this back. Doug? 
what are we going to kill this year? Oh, Ooh. shit. Put me on the spot. Oh, if boy. If it doesn't come true, we're going to round up that thing. Yeah, let me take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> round up. <laughs> Hit that thing with we're some gonna, ground clear. We're going to burn that off. <laughs> that motherfucker ain't ever growing back. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> Hitting the roots. Um, I'm feeling like I'm going to kill a big one this year. I'm feeling it. Throw a okay. number out, boy. 178. Ooh, there we go. Ooh, there we go. Spicy. My guy. Daddy yeah. likey. My guy. <laughs> Daddy likey. I think, Eric, right. I think Eric's going to kill a 153. That's Ooh. a good buck. I can do that's that. That's a damn nice good buck. I can do that. Eight point? Ooh. Oh, no, that's even nine better. Pointer. That's a big nine. nine. Okay. Nine. okay. Nine. 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 Time's going to help him a little bit get there. 153 <laughs> inch nine's a big boy. Hey, yeah, yeah. Nine. I take uh, that. That's a thick boy. Come on, give me one. What's up, baby? I feel like Kurt's going to. Put it on a monster. Oh, come on. Give Look me, at him. Look at his nose seen, itching. I've seen the trail camp pictures. So. <laughs> Give me a number, boy. All right. You're going to get a 166. <laughs> or bigger. Or right. bigger. smaller. 166. Yeah. Okay. Man. Austin, uh, are you going through trad again or elite? Uh, it could be either one. Depends on how big he is. Ooh, you got to make a prediction for both. Ooh, well, no, God it's got to be a general prediction because right, right. it could go either way. Okay. 172. Whoa. Damn, I'll take that. Todd, I'm gonna, I got a good feeling about you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I had a big year last year. You did. I'm going to say uh, 167. You're a good man. Good man. I think good we'd man. all be happy hey, with that season. Did, if, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Wow. What a group of solid Dude, that's positive. Yeah, you guys, don't even worry about it. I was kind of expecting like a goose egg. Like Austin, you've had your time. You're you're not no, killing shit this year. I can't say that. I don't want to put you down. <laughs> this is confidence in your in your crew yeah. is important. I just I'm just waiting for the year that Doug's like, yeah, you're not going to kill shit. Um, okay. No. That would <laughs> I'm excited to see Doug's 170s. Doug, I know I was going to go bigger, but you got shed, this, I, man. I, from the shed, I found I was going to go bigger, but yeah. I'll play it safe. You got to be conservative. Yeah. Listen. Anything can happen in the whitetail woods. You never know. And that's the best thing about whitetails, right? Like, that's why we do it. That's why we're so into it. And that's why when someone asks us, what do you talk about? You've done 460 episodes. You don't understand the layers to the game. You know, there's a lot to talk about. They don't get it. Even if we talk about the same thing on a different episode, different guests, and depends on the episode, we have different perspectives or different opinions on that time. You know, just because we have an opinion now... Doesn't mean in 20 episodes I might not have a di way different opinion than I do right now on something. So that's the fun of it, right? You know, mm -hmm. that's what makes it's it evolving. Podcast. It's evolving. And uh, if you're going to hold us to, you know, one episode is what we did on the record and that's it, then um, eat shit. You don't understand the process. Every season is different. <laughs> Every season is different. So, uh, Todd, what do you think? You got anything to add? It's been fun. I appreciate you guys letting me come in. It's uh, always good chatting with you guys, especially about Big Deer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, great studio. Look forward to doing it again. Absolutely. Yeah, always glad to have you, man. You're welcome anytime. Our green room is always open for you, especially if Appreciate it's it. not in the studio. Yeah, Come on in and hang out and have a beer. Then we're going to have a fight party here uh, at the time of recording a McGregor Poirier fight party here at the studio. It's on. Which by the time this launches, that'll be done and over, and who knows who won. I'll be up at Jordan's Resort this weekend. Oh, uh, cool. Angler's nice. Haven, huh? Angler's Haven, yeah. Back up there at the pullback and let go in the line and kugels land, huh? Yeah, he right. mixes a mean old fashioned, I'm telling you. Oh boy, I'm ready for You're it. You're not gonna want to come home. I'm just ready to shut my phone off and relax for a week. It's beautiful up there. Sounds yeah. like a good time. Well, we have some uh potential big things in the works here in the future. Um Todd will be hanging out with your brother. Sounds good. And uh you guys got anything to close with? Any any words of peace? Or encouragement for our listeners here. Nope, we got some new hats in. We got the youth hats now, so let's plug that a little bit. The Geyerbuck hats are in. Yep, we got um, a new T-shirt in store right now. We have another new T-shirt on it getting printed right now. So we're the go shoot your bow shirts are getting revamped. Revamped. The uh, logo shirt is up. Oh, instead of black and lime green, it's now OD green and black logo. Yep, with a little logo cool. on the back. Oh, yep. Is it this it, one? Doug's, yep, rocking that one. Yep. Yep. Doug's rocking it. Doug's rocking it. Doug's rocking it. He can be our and model. If you are tuning into the podcast on Spotify or whatever podcast platform, you might notice a new art. We updated the art for the first time in fucking, I don't know how long since we started, probably. Since we started. Um, a little different logo, not as loud, not as green. Let us know if you like it. If you don't like I, I I don't know how I feel about it. I like it. It looks good, but I don't like the clickability as a small square on a It's not set in stone yet. 
It's not so anything can happen. Yeah. I yeah. like it. We can change it. I think it's cool. I like it. Absolutely. It's classy. And we also have new bar tavern uh coasters. Koozies, you mean? Koozies. <laughs> I can call them koozies. Um if you're watching this on video, we have them here and we're proud of them. And we're gonna hand them out to taverns around yep. the area and uh people we like. So if you know a tavern in your area that would like a slew of working class bow hunter that'll hand them out uh, like cardboard style pub coasters. Let us know. We we are, we're also going to have a sticker pack coming up in the store. Yeah, sticker pack. So instead of buying individual, we'll have a pack, and it'll probably be more worth it. We'll have like a couple of each stickers and yep. all that, and it'll be sold in just a package. So if you want to buy a whole pack, give them out to your buddies. Yep. Um, make your girlfriend stick one on her car, your boyfriend, if you got that kind of dude in your life. Um, we'll figure it out for you, you know? Yep. Absolutely. There it is. All right. You know what to do? Go shoot your bow. We love you.